Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for tonight. We praise your name because of the great things you are doing. Thank you for what you have given us in this church and how you taught us the scriptures. Father, we are asking that today you will teach us things in your word in Jesus' name. And we we'll pray that you establish us in the truth with all these things you are teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. From Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, I want to read to you from verse 13. Acts, chapter 15, from verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is falling down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of all time has in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased each the apostles and elders with the whole church, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, so named Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And he wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and the elders and brethren sent greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, for as much as were purged that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have Asserted their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater body than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fear ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation, and Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. We have been looking at this important chapter, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. 
And there is a central truth in this chapter. There was a problem in the early church. And the early church, various branches, connected with the problem, so that it was necessary to settle the problem. Now let us understand, a problem may arise in a church, or with a group of churches, that a problem is arising does not mean that God has left the place, does not mean that the word of God is no more there, does not mean that the Holy Ghost is no more working there, it doesn't mean that Satan has taken over the church of God. And Satan is now ruling just because there is a problem. You see, there are young people that do not understand that where there are groups of people, just a single family, a family, for example, of just two or three or five, or a branch church of just 50 or 100 or 500, or headquarters church like ours with thousands of people, and then supervising the work of the branch churches all over the nation and maybe in other nations there are people that do not understand that where you have groups of people together there could be problems now these problems are not strange if you read your bible throughout from the beginning to the end you'll find that where there are groups of people there could be problem what determines whether god is there or not is how you handle the problem how you settle the problem. Take your family. That there is a problem in your family doesn't mean that God is no more there. How you settle that problem is the real issue. Take a zone that there are some problems that have risen up in a particular zone. Doesn't mean that the people there are not children of God. It doesn't mean that they are no more worshipping God. It doesn't mean they are no more part of the church. How you solve the problem is the real issue. In a branch church, let's take Deeper Life Bible Church for example. In a branch church in a state, when we hear there is a problem, might even be a serious problem, a doctrinal problem, that doesn't mean that God has left them, or that Christ is no more there, or that the Holy Spirit is no more working. How you solve the problem is the real issue. In our church here at the headquarters, there may be a problem. There isn't at present, but who knows? There may be a problem. Now, how you solve the problem, your reaction to the problem, your attitude to the problem, how you handle that problem is the real issue that will show whether you are a mature, developing Christian or not, or you are just immature, childish, um, foolish believers, so to say. So a problem arose in the early church. Now, whenever a problem is arising, there are some individuals, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, who are looking up to God, who think they are hearing the voice of God, and they are not hearing the voice of God. They are thinking that this is what God is now saying, and the whole church is not following after that. And they feel that they have more knowledge, more revelation, more understanding, more consecration more intimacy with God than the whole church together and these individuals maybe one maybe two maybe five maybe ten they will rise up to say this thing we're hearing from God this vision we're getting from God this revelation we're getting from God the whole church must accept it if the whole church does not does not accept it then the problem will continue you know in the early church there were some brethren they were saved, they were children of God, they were born again. But then they began thinking, feeling that the church is deviating from the real truth. They felt that the church was lowering the standard. They felt that Paul in particular, Barnabas in particular, even though they were called of God, even though God is sending them out, they felt that as a as a method of getting these Gentiles in their thousands and perhaps in their millions to know the Lord, they are evading the real issues that they want to just get converts at all uh, by all means. That Paul was very busy looking for Gentile converts and he wanted everybody saved, he wanted everybody coming to the kingdom, and because of that, he was lowering the standard. He wasn't telling these Gentiles the whole truth. 
the complete thing. He was telling them, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And they had caught him in Antioch. They had caught him in Cilicia. They had caught him in various places that he went, that he was preaching. He watered down, what they call, a watered down gospel. Just believe. Just believe. And thou shalt be saved. And your whole household. And they listened to him. They said, well, maybe he just didn't remember to mention it in that other place. They listened to him again. And what he was saying is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of Virgin Mary, who lived a perfect life and died on the cross of Calvary and rose up the third day, and now is given to us as our redemption. He's given to us as a Messiah. He's given to us as a mediator. Believe on that Lord Jesus Christ alone and you'll be saved. No circumcision. No killing of any animals. No observation of any mosaic law. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And after you are saved, there is only one law. It is the royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. If you do that, everything is all right. Oh, and they said, Paul is missing it. And these few brethren, they felt they were hearing from God. They felt Paul must be wrong. They felt this is not the whole gospel. They felt this is wrong doctrine. They felt no. You, you are cheating these people. You are deceiving these people. And you are just trying to get many, many people to say, Yes, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he had told them that if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you confess with your mouth, thou shalt be saved. They said, No, that cannot be right. They said, No, there must be something more. How about these Gentiles that are not circumcised in the flesh? How about these Gentiles that are not keeping the law of Moses? How about, you know, this in their life, and this in their life, and this in their lives? So they, be they began contending, arguing against what Paul and Barnabas, what they were preaching. And you know, they made a great mistake. Because if you have studied the life of Paul, Paul was preaching the gospel and was willing to suffer for the gospel. Paul was a person that was serious with the teaching of the word of God. And he was a person who had had revelations uh, from God, intimacy with God. He was a person saturated with the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And this was the man, the apostle, that they were accusing. They said he was lowering the gospel. And I dare tell you this, none of these people had ever gone to prison like Paul the apostle had gone to prison. None of these people had traveled as wide as Paul had traveled. None of these people had suffered the cold, the nakedness. None of them had suffered, uh, you know, from all the robbers, uh, you know, in the way like Paul suffered. None of them had fought with the beasts at, um, in Ephesus like Paul had suffered. And yet they felt, you know, in the easy chair. They felt in their private chambers that Paul was teaching the wrong thing. And then they discussed it. As they discussed it, they will not yield. They said, no. Paul, you are misleading the people. You are not telling them the whole thing. You are telling them just be saved by the grace of God through faith. No, 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 we can't accept that. And this thing was creating some havoc. It was going to divide the church. Some people were still, will stay with Paul and Barnabas. They will say, these were the men that hazarded their lives, jeopardized their lives, put their lives into their hands and they were willing to even die for the preaching of the gospel. They must be right. Other people were saying, these brethren from Jerusalem that are teaching us these things from Judea, maybe, maybe they are right. Some were confused. Eventually they came to Jerusalem, the headquarters church, to settle that controversy. To settle that problem, while they were doing that, of course the work slowed down. Whenever a controversy arises in the church, it slows down the work. You see, controversy of false doctrine arising in the church is more serious than persecution from the world. Persecution from the world never stops the preaching of the gospel. It only increases opportunities of more people hearing about the gospel. Opposition 
from other religions, opposition from other people outside the face, outside the fold, does not necessarily stop the preaching of the gospel. It only makes the preaching of the gospel even spread wider, but a controversy within the church, a problem within the church will do a great harm, a great harm, great havoc that opposition or persecution from outside may not do. That's why, my brothers and sisters, whenever you allow yourself to be used of the devil, whenever you allow yourself to think in the negative way, whenever you allow yourself to, to bring up a controversy, you are doing more harm to the church than persecutors outside. You are more guilty than a Muslim man who doesn't want the gospel to be spread or to go forth as a Christian, as a believer, a child of God, or a Christian worker in the church, zona leader, area leader, house fellowship leader, an usher, a member of the choir, an interpreter, anybody in the church, whenever you allow the devil to use you, use your mouth, use your action, use your attitude to begin a controversy on something not essential, on something not important, and you delay the church, you draw back the hands of the church. You draw back the progress of the church. Whenever you are doing that, you are worse than a Muslim man outside that is trying to persecute, you know, the church. You are worse than an idol worshiper outside that is trying to persecute the church. Because the persecution of a religious man outside... The persecution, the opposition of an idol worshiper outside, it never stops the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel will go on, even in more strength and more power, uh, when the um, religious man is persecuting than before he started persecuting. Look at it from Acts of the Apostles. From the very beginning, all these apostles were persecuted. Many people were getting converted. They were thrown into the prison. Many people were getting converted. They were abused. They were beaten. Yet the gospel was spreading. But at this time now, Paul, a great apostle, a great missionary, a great evangelist, a great teacher, he couldn't preach anymore. He had to settle down at home, settling the controversy. Barnabas, chosen of God, appointed by God, sent by God. He couldn't continue the preaching anymore. He had to come back home, preaching the, um, you know, settling the controversy. And you know in the church, if the church is at peace, if there is no problem, if there is, if there is no controversy, we'll just be going on, on missionary efforts, crusade work, the teaching of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, the expansion of the church, the establishment of the church, the planting of other churches, when there is no problem, but let a problem arise. And then we have to come back home. We have to settle down. We have to say, well, we, we cannot continue preaching the gospel to other people when the church is being scattered. And you know, when you are involved in that, and you are not controlling your tongue, you are not controlling your own mind, you are not controlling your own thoughts, and you allow the devil to use you in, in a very small way. You know, two workers getting together and saying, you know, this, uh, you know, the way we started and um, the way they are doing things now, uh, do you think you agree with this? That's the beginning. That's the beginning. When you begin to get in groups and in gangs of two people, three people, five people, ten people, and you begin to discuss, discuss the church of God, discuss the kingdom of God, discuss this church that the Holy Ghost himself is working in. At the time you begin to do that in two or three or times, you are beginning a controversy and you are going to do more havoc. You are going to do more havoc. That thing that is just starting like a little stream, that thing that is just starting like, you know, just a little drop is going to become a Niagara and it's going to sweep away a lot of things and a lot of people. That's why you should be very, very careful. Now, in the early church, this was the problem and they came together to settle it. We read part of this before that Peter rose up and, uh, you know, while they were arguing and discussing, it, it was a fiery thing. It was a real controversy. It was a real problem in the church. You know, some young people that were there, I'm sure they must have been confusing. Ah, where is our sanctification? Where is our submission? And you know, really, my brothers and sisters, whenever there is a controversy, 
that we couldn't settle privately, we must ask the question, where is our sanctification, really? You know, whenever there is a little problem that we cannot solve, we cannot remove at that point, maybe with a local pastor in a deep Alai Bible church, in the state here in Lagos, or a local pastor in another state of deeper life, and uh, you know, this problem of uh, that has arisen, we cannot settle it privately in 30 minutes and get on with the job. We must be asking ourselves, where is the steadfastness, the sanctification, the, the submission? Where is the obedience to leadership? But that was it in the early church. These people were so rebellious. They were so stubborn, they were so hard-hearted, they were so disrespectful, they wouldn't listen to Paul the Apostle. He pleaded with them, he told them of revelations, he told them of what the Lord had taught him, they said, no, we're sorry about that. Whatever the Lord has taught you, that's all right, but their circumcision and the law of Moses, the people must keep it. If they don't, we don't regard them as saved. So Peter rose up when the council came together. And he talked to them and he said, uh, Brethren, you know what had happened before? And now James rose up in verse 13. And James applied the scriptures. Let's listen to him. After the and uh, verse 13, and after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Don't listen to your thoughts, hearken unto me. Don't listen to that, you know, to that thing that is coming up in your mind that you say, no, I will never agree. You know, pack all that aside. You, you never solve any problem by just holding on to your own stick, holding on to your own point, holding on to your own idea. You never solve a problem like that. Now drop all those things. Those things that are coming up in your mind saying they're lowering the standard. They are not telling them to keep the law of Moses. They are not telling them to be humble enough. They are not telling them to wear rags. They are not telling them to, you know, never smile. They are not telling them that if they are saved, they must keep on frowning. They are not telling them if they are saved, they must never even come out at all. They must be fasting every day of the week. You know, drop all those ideas hacking onto me. And James talked to them and said, you know, as young believers, as young people, you've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. There is mighty God we have preached unto you. You have never seen him face to face. You have never heard his voice. Heaven has never opened to declare unto you revelations from above. You listen to people that have seen that Jesus Christ face to face. Listen to those people that have heard the voice of the almighty God face to face. The people that were at River Jordan. When the Holy Ghost came as a dove upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The people that have gone to the Mount of Transfiguration. And they have seen things that you never have seen. You listen to them and keep quiet. Hold your peace. This is a type of controversy you are brought into the church because of your immaturity. And you are talking about things you don't understand. Hold your peace. James told them, Simon, you know, this is an apostle calling the, calling the big apostle by the first name. Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. This man was talking with authority. You know, this wasn't the James of the brother of John that had died in, you know, in an earlier chapter in Acts of the Apostles. This James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this man was authority. This man knew what he was talking about. And he said, Simeon has declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets. He said, come back to the scriptures. Come back to the scriptures. To this, to what the apostle Simeon had said, Peter had said, agree the words of the prophets as it is written after this. I will return. And I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is falling down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up so that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. Says the Lord, who doeth all these things. Number one, James was saying, let's go back to the scriptures. Forget your feeling. You know, I've discovered in church problems. 
people are sentimental, not scriptural. People have thoughts. They do not have the word of the Lord. And you know, they are always saying, they cannot point to a, a scripture about the things they are having controversy about. They cannot point to thus says the Lord for today, for now, on the things they have, the, you, you know, the things they have controversy about. And they are always saying, I feel, I think, or I just don't like this. I just don't like this. And they are not going to point to the scriptures. But James said, now, some of you are hot in your feelings. Some of you are boisterous in your attitude. Some of you are just too loud in, you know, what you are saying. Now keep quiet and let's go back to the scriptures. All these things that were seen, what Paul said, what Barnabas said, what Peter said, Simon, what he said, to these, agree the scriptures, the words of the prophets, as it is written, that after this, I will return. That means he was not going into what we call in theology, eschatology into the study of prophetic writings he was saying you know the plan of god that he is going to visit the gentiles while the jews or the israelites are set apart and after this after calling the gentiles into the light into the gospel after getting all these gentiles saved after that i will return and will build again the tabernacles of david which is now falling down which is now falling down because the revival that shifted from Israel, I mean as a nation, now shifting to the Gentiles. And he said, I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord who doeth all these things. And then James said something, now listen to me. Very, very essential. What was said in verse 18? Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. You know what James was saying? James was saying, all these things we're hearing about Gentiles being converted without being circumcised. Gentiles coming to the Lord without keeping the law of Moses. To us, it is strange. To us, it seems out of the way. To us, it appears totally new. But do you know that God is not taken by surprise? That known unto God are all these works, all these things that are happening, they are the work of God. And they are known unto God from the beginning of the foundation of the world. The beginning of the world. And you know when we talk about our church here, some people don't understand that we as human beings, we do not know everything that God will do in his own way, at his own time, by a group of people. But known unto God are all the things that have been done from the very beginning. We are the beginning of deeper Christian life ministry. We didn't know everything that God will do when we started. We started with a simple Bible study group. That was all we knew. You can only know what God has revealed. At a later time, he then added another thing. That, that was new to us, not new to God. At another time, he added another thing. That was new to us, not new to God. But because it is new to us, generally human beings are very, very skeptical of anything that they were not doing before. Very, very skeptical. Let me tell you this. In America right now, there are people that in America, Christians, Christians, whether they are born again or not, I don't know, but Christians in quotes, they, they never ride a car in America. You know why? When their own parents were born again, those many days, many years ago, their forefathers, there was no vehicle. There was nothing. And then they read a part of the Bible that says in the, in the last day, knowledge will increase. And when the vehicle came, oh, they said, this is what the Bible said, that in the last days, knowledge will increase. And uh, they are afraid of entering into a car. I went to America myself. I saw them riding on donkeys. And I asked the person that was going with me, I said, who are those people? He said, they are Christians. I said, what are they riding donkeys? He said, because they are Christians. I said, 
what do you mean because they are Christians? Oh yes, because they believe that anything that is new is of the devil. A car is of the devil. An aeroplane is of the devil. All these things that are new, they are of the devil. But you know, Jesus never rode a car. Jesus rode a donkey and they are following Jesus riding donkeys. Think about it in America. Think about it. In America, I heard of a church, Holiness Church, Holiness Church. You know, that church divided. You know why they divided? Because the serious, serious, serious Christians, devoted Christians, they believe that if you are sanctified, you will not be of the world. And if you are wearing a tie, you are of the world. And that church divided, split, not because of a passage in Genesis chapter something verse something. Not because of a passage in Matthew. Not because of a passage in Acts of the Apostles. Not because of the epistles. Because of wearing time. Controversy. Problem. A church dividing into two. Separating. Because of wearing time. When they get to heaven. I don't know what they are going to wear. Because they might be surprised when we get to heaven. You know. Some people divide uh, somebody, you know, writing to another person saying, Oh, you know, in a church, God doesn't want any church building because in the early church, there was no church building. Another church again will divide because of church building. They prefer to stay outside in the tent being beaten by rain for the glory of God. Uh, you know, controversy starts in churches because people are not willing to listen to the word of the Lord because this may be new to you, but to God, James said, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is. Now, he, he wanted to tell them that, let's reach a conclusion. Let's settle this thing. Let's finalize this thing. And if you will listen to me, that's what James was saying. My sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from the pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of all time, as in every city, them that preach him, being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day, then it pleased the apostles and the elders. You see the unity? Generally, for division to really take effect and take root, it takes effect and takes root among the leadership of the church, among the apostles and the elders. Because no matter the problem with a member of the church, a member of the church may say, well, uh, I'm not interested in that church because now they are wearing tie, they are wearing suit now, and they do not allow bathroom sleepers in the church anymore. They don't allow us to just keep our air untidy. They now want us to be neat, and I don't want that. All I want is that I like to be uh, dirty outside, because when I'm dirty, I'm humble. They're now encouraging the members of the church that, you know, if they have money, they can buy a car. But, you know, I believe that that is being worldly. I prefer to, you know, if I'm coming from Tinumbo or coming from Ikeja, I believe that it's a mark of holiness if I don't try the vehicle at all, if I come on my feet. And then I'll be able to say, brethren, you know, I'm so serious with the Lord. I'm so devoted. I'm so humble. You know, I came to church today. I came on foot. Uh-huh. That's holiness. And you know, if it's just a member of the church that is saying that, if it's just a member of the church that says, I, I disagree with this, I disagree with this, all that that member of the church can do is just to leave the church. Nobody knows him. And that's not going to cause a serious division in the church. But when the apostles, when they begin to nurse, Thoughts of division, of disunity in the heart. The real workers that are known in the church, all over in the nation, when they begin to nurse thoughts of division and disunity in the heart, that's when the real problem is there. But thank God, among these apostles, matured people. That's why uh, people don't become workers in the church, apostles and elders in the church, until they are really matured. Really matured. That they can stomach a lot of things, swallow a lot of things. You can insult them, you can disagree with them, you can push them, you can draw them, you can accuse them, you can criticize them. But because they're adults, they're matured, 
they'll be able to stand. I'm not talking of people that are standing in the church openly and apparently, and yet internally and privately are causing division. I'm not talking of that. Those people are not mature. Those people are not keeping their Christian experiences. I'm talking of people that really love the Lord, and they are so mature that it doesn't matter what criticism or opposition you are giving to them in the church, they never will sow a seed of discord, a seed of disunity. You see, these apostles, they were united. They were one. And when James stood up and he said, This is my sentence. All the other apostles and elders, they agreed to that. Look at verse, um, verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Namely Judas, surnamed Basabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren, and they wrote letters by them. After this manner, the apostles and the elders and the brethren sent greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with what? Subverting your souls. Now, when somebody is starting a controversy, that is what he does. And members of this church, you need, to be, you need to be understanding. You need to be very intelligent. Because there are people, they may, they may be from this church, they may be from outside the church. Whenever somebody is, call, is going to cause division, whenever somebody is going to cause disunity, he is not going to come to you and say, now, let us separate from this church. No. Is going to come to you in a soft manner, in a gentle manner, in a, in a quiet manner, and it's going to ask you some questions. Uh, how do you enjoy the church now? How do you see all these things that are going on in the church now? Uh, what do you think about all these things that the church, are, the church people are doing now? Aren't you praying for the church that God will rescue us from apostasy? Aren't you praying for the church that God will, you know, send us back to where we started? Aren't you praying that God, the Holy Ghost, in mercy, will spare this church? Because even though they are, you know, growing, they are becoming many, what do you think about this, their spiritual lives? You know, that's the way they are going to start. What do you think about the choir? What do you think about the message? What do you think about the praying? What do you think about the miracles? What do you think about all these testimonies that all these people are giving? Every time now, well, all that we just say is, um, you know, they are getting uh, healed, they are getting delivered, they are getting miracles, they are getting money. We don't hear testimony of this, we don't hear testimony of this, we don't hear testimony of that. Well, I hope you are praying for our church, our church, praying. What are you praying for, for the church? That God should help us stop all the testimonies. That there should be no miracles again. You see, that's how discord will start. That's how a bad thing will start. And when somebody comes to you in a quiet manner, in a slow manner, in a silent manner like that, it's already starting a controversy. And so they said, these brethren that came to subvert your souls, it will shift you. It will dislocate you. It will subvert your soul. It will make you thinking of, oh, there is a problem with the coordinator. There is a problem with the head usher. There is a problem with, uh, you know, the zonal leader. Now, the moment you begin to think about that, somebody is subverting your soul. Somebody is saying, look at how that uh, coordinator is behaving. Do you, aren't you praying for him? Don't you think that this is wrong? Look at how the zonal leader is uh, behaving. Uh, inside you, aren't you praying for him? They are starting. That's controversy. That's division. Uh, look at, uh, you know, how, the, how they are managing the whole church now. What? Well, even the general superintendent now, we cannot call him bro anymore. He is now general superintendent. I think they will soon tell us to be calling him apostle. Well, let's be praying. If the church is not suitable for me, I'm looking for another church. You know, that's out of start. A controversy, a problem on something that is not essential, something that is not important, just because of the dissatisfaction in the heart of that man. He wants to carry over that and destroy the whole church of thousands of people. You know, subverting the soul. It says in verse 24, for as much as we have heard, 
that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. There may be some people in the church. After we have finished our normal meeting, our Monday Bible study or Thursday Miracle Revival Hour, or we have finished the Sunday um, devotional worship, they will still get some 12, 15 people together in a corner somewhere and uh, say, well, they have uh, done their own. Let's come together and really seriously now seek the Lord. Now come together and seriously seek the Lord and then they go to one house somewhere, not house fellowship, not part of the church, and then all that we have already taught, they began to reteach everything in their own version. And they begin to tell the, the people they are collected together, saying, let us, uh, let us consecrate to the Lord. That, oh Lord, if all the thousands of Bagara people are backsliding, going into apostasy, we are going to stand in Jesus' name. Twelve people. All the rest of us, we are backsliding. And God happens to be using those of us preachers who are backsliding. And God is not using these people who are holding on totally to the truth. Think about it. All these things that the Lord is doing in the crusades, in the church, everywhere. They are not interested. They are not interested. They are controversy. That now we're teaching people to, to be neat and to do things that are right. And to be presentable and godly and dignified in their appearance. That, that's their problem. That's their controversy. And they bring all these people apart in a very small group. And they're teaching them, oh God, we're going to be serious. Oh God, we're going to be serious. That's division, my friend. You're going astray when you're doing that. And you're laboring on something that is not essential. You, you are destroying yourself and destroying those people. And if anybody has called a group of people like that, you better come out of that. Because it's an Absalom group. And you know the case, you know the case of Absalom? You know the end of Absalom? You know, it's a Judas Iscariot case. Judas Iscariot no more satisfied with even Jesus Christ. Think about it. Jesus was no more perfect. Jesus was no more dealing with him well. Jesus wasn't giving him enough money. And he must have a way of getting money by selling out Jesus Christ. What a shame. But you know he said, you come out of that type of small group, small association within the church, a church within the church. And he is the one that, you know, knows the right thing, goes in the right direction. If he happens to be a worker in the church, uh, you know that he has already missed his way. You've seen his opportunity to be a worker in the church, to subvert your soul, to draw you aside, to destroy you, and to cut you away from the real church, from the central church. Now in verse 25, it seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord. The, all these apostles were in real unity to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to, to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Now, what they were saying had the Spirit's approval. Their sentence, the sentence of the apostles wasn't just an isolated thing. Something coming out of their mind. Something that they just dreamt about. Something they were just planning apart from the Holy Ghost. And um, I tell you, all the things that we have been doing by the grace of God in this church, Everything has been according to the word of God. And sometimes uh, when I receive some foolish letters, I just laugh. Because all these people that are talking about, uh, the things they are talking about, they know nothing about the Bible. You know, somebody sending a copy of uh, Miracle and Healing uh, News that were published to me, saying he counted uh, how many times my name appeared uh, on that paper. And because my name appeared there that Pastor Kumi prayed for them, they got their healing. Pastor Kumi prayed for them, they had their miracle. Because of that, he feels that that is no more of God. 
that man is not reading the Bible. Because if you are reading the Bible from Genesis to Deuteronomy, the name of Moses came up, you don't know how many times. You don't know how many times. It, it, almost every chapter of, um, of all those uh, from Exodus, from the point he was born, on to the end of Deuteronomy, you have Moses, 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 all the time. When you read the book of Joshua, you need to discover how many times the name of Joshua came up in that single book. And when you read in the in the first Kings and second Kings and first Samuel, second Samuel, you need to understand how many times the name of David came up over and over and over. Come into the Acts of the Apostles and begin to count how many times the name of Peter came up over and over. Come into the um, latter part of the uh, Acts of the Apostles and read how many times the name of Paul, Paul, Paul came out because of the great thing God did through them. And somebody, you know, sending a uh, miracle and healing news to me and, you know, underlining my name, saying uh, Komoye came up uh, this number of times, wasting his time. Wasting his time. He's not grateful that a person that should have died was withdrawn from the hospital and the person came here with prayed. The person was raised from the dead. He wasn't grateful that a child that would have died was prayed for and the child was now well. He wasn't grateful a marriage that would have been split in two because no children. They came here, God gave them children and now we're all rejoicing. He is sorrowful. He doesn't see all the goodness of God. The mercy of God, the power of God, the compassion of God on healing those people, delivering them. All he's busy doing is underlining the name of a person in a, in a particular paper. And it's going to cause division because of that. Because somebody gave testimony. Think about it. But you know, all the things that are being done, we do everything according to the word of God. And thank God for this church. I said we thank God for this church. Are you happy for the church? Yes. Of course. I told you before that a healing church is a happy church. And because of the healings and the miracles, we are just grateful to God for what God is doing. And if you have a heart of love, a heart of mercy, a heart of compassion, a heart that is rejoicing because souls are getting saved, you are rejoicing because the sick is getting healed, you are rejoicing because of the great and powerful things that the Lord is doing, you wouldn't have time for controversy. You wouldn't have time for propagating a division anywhere. Now, all they did add the Spirit's approval. And they said in verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. The Spirit's approval was there to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye have seen from meat suffered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, and from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fear ye well. So when they dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. Now something is very important here. When that controversy was settled, that chapter was closed. Nobody brought it up again. That's how to settle problem in the church. Whenever a controversy has been settled, a problem has been ended, then keep quiet about it. You ask a question in the time of Sadi Scripture, because you were confused about that issue, the moment that thing has been answered from the Scriptures, then you keep quiet about it. If you have been having a small group somewhere that you are trying to confuse, now that you have had a message like this, you settle the matter, get the people back to the church and back to the zone, and don't cause any division, then keep quiet about that issue. Let the controversy get out of your mind, out of the way, and be a real Christian, sanctified and submissive to the teaching of the Word of God, and don't bring up that thing again. The moment they settled it, the moment they finalized it, everything was okay the apostles now gave writing to instruct all the other churches that's the church administration we believe in that the headquarters church has authority has power over the other branch churches in any stage in any country having the same name preaching the same doctrine following the same way and if there is anyone anywhere who is a pastor of deeper life bible church who is trying to get the disciples to himself and will not allow any influence from the headquarters church to be upon those people that person is a fallout it's a fall away person 
is a person that is rebellious and stubborn. It's a person that is not working for God. It's a person that works, wants to work for himself or for his own pocket. Now in uh, verse 32, And Judas and Silas, being prophets, also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. After they are tarried there, apostles, notwithstanding it, please Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. There was a submissive attitude. That thing had been settled. All the churches were submissive to the epistle, to the decree, to the thing that came from Jerusalem, from the headquarters church. And that is how we ought to be. If you have a problem in the zone, you are not able to resolve it. Remember, please, that you as um, a Christian, maybe a part-time worker in the ministry, you wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, then you, you go to your place of work, you run all about, then you finish about 5 o'clock, you rush to the Bible study, then you go back home. While you go back home, you are still thinking about your business. You have 30 minutes of quiet time in the evening. Then in the morning again, you wake up and you are running about. In your condition, in your situation, you won't understand the Bible as a person, a leader of the church that is spending his, all his life in the Bible from the morning till the evening. In the night, dreaming about it, not thinking about any other thing. Has no other thing to do. Only to pray and read the Bible. Only to preach and read the Bible. Only to eat and read the Bible. Only to sleep and read the Bible. When he wakes up, is the Bible. When he's going on the way, he's meditating on the Bible. You want to understand the Bible as much as that person? For you to have a controversy when you don't have time with the world. You have not studied the background. You have not studied anything about church administration. For you to, you know, be coming from your place of work and be saying, I don't agree with this. <laughs> My brother, think about it. You're not serious about what you're saying. You're, you're pointing to as, as a novice. You're looking at a doctor. A doctor in the hospital that is spending all his life researching and reading those medical books. And you see him treating a patient. And you as a layman that just knows a little of, um, you know, first age, first aid or hygiene book. And you're saying you don't agree with what a professor in medical science is doing. You don't know what you are talking. And when you see a man in this deeper life church that stands behind this pulpit, giving all his time, all his life, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, wanting to feed the children of God, praying all the time, listening to the Holy Ghost. You need to be submissive to the word of God. That's what Paul the Apostle told all those people in Galatia, all those people at Ephesus, all those people in Rome, all those people in Philippi, all those people in Colossae and Thessalonica. He told them that he had been even to the third heaven. Told the Corinthians like that. And they had no case because all that he was teaching, he wasn't taught by man. He was taught by God himself. And a man that had got the mysteries of the kingdom like that, what could a novice, not understanding the Bible, be arguing with such a man? Now let's be humble. In the church, there is leadership. And the leadership is to direct us and control us and lead us in the doctrine, in the administration, in everything. And whenever anything is rising up in your heart to cause a problem of discord, of disunity, to cause a controversy, you tell your heart, no. This is a church where the leadership is serious of the word of God. That thing that is rising up in your heart is pride. That thing is being instigated by the devil, whoever, you know, whoever you may be. Because the devil can influence anybody. And you must not yield yourself, submit yourself to any thought of the devil, you know, to destroy a work like this. My brother, my sister, how would you feel if you came here on Thursday for, that's next Thursday, for Miracle Revival Hour? And you are coming in your thousands. And you saw that this church, this building, I'm not talking of the people now, but the real building, you saw that a bulldozer from somewhere had come and leveled everything, destroyed everything. And you didn't hear it before. You were just, you know, coming to the, just coming for Miracle Revival Hour on Thursday. And getting out to that place, you just saw that everything was totally down. The energy that has gone into the building of this church. 
the money that has gone into the building of the church. Somebody has come with a bulldozer, with a group of people. It's leveled everything. You might cry for one whole year and never stop crying. But think about it. This church, this build, the buildings here, they just started being built since 1981. Just about five years. But think about the real church now with thousands and thousands of people saved, some of them sanctified, some of them baptized in the Holy Ghost, and many, many people rejoicing, saying, I never knew that Christianity was like this. They brought me to deeper life. God has changed my life. Suppose you come on one day, and this church has been scattered by controversy. Somebody who is, you know, is not satisfied with uh, wearing tie, wearing suit. Somebody who is not satisfied with house fellowship system. Somebody who is not satisfied with television program we're having. Somebody who is not satisfied with the crusades we're holding has planted discord, disunity, seeds of evil in the hearts of people and we have scattered this church and then maybe you just traveled home and you came back maybe after some weeks and then you want to attend your church the church you love so very well the church you have been saved the church you've been sanctified the church that has made the power of god to come in your life and you came to the church oh and they say that church is scattered there are no more there they are the problem disagreement and you know they all scattered about how about uh, bro kumui now well uh, since the work was not easy in Nigeria, they are inviting him in America, so he's now going about in America preaching. How about our people here? Well, he felt that uh, so nothing can be done again. How would you feel? The work of so many years, the work of so many people, the work that has taken prayer and fasting and diligence and trouble, the work that has taken so much opposition for you to yield yourself to the devil and destroy something beautiful like this. You just look around and see the people. How many the people are? Have you ever seen this in Nigeria before? That on Sunday, a place like this will be filled to overflowing four times. Then for somebody to come and just scatter everything. Rise up and talk to the Lord. And you give yourself to the Lord. And you tell the Lord, you are not going to allow the devil to use you. To plant a, a seed of discord, a seed of division. You are not going to allow the devil to make you have any animosity in your heart, any hatred in your heart. Against a zonal leader, against a coordinator, against the pastor, against anyone. But that you are going to yield yourself to the Lord. You are going to be submissive. That the church will go on. 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 Go on in power. Go on with all the programs. Go on with all that the Lord wants to do. Give all your heart. Love him with all your soul. And anything that will bring this God or division in your heart. And anything that will bring this God or division in your heart. Let him cleanse it up. Let him destroy it. Heal yourself to the Lord completely and totally. Any heart of rebellion, take it away. 